Welcome to the second talk in a series I'm giving about Moroggana, his life, his poetry, and his association with Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharshi. In the first part, I gave some details of his background, his early life. I noted how he became aware of Bhagavan through his father-in-law, Dandapani Swami, and how he came to Tiruvannamalai in September 1923, having become convinced that Bhagavan was the guru he was looking for. During his uh, first visit in September, he had two very dramatic experiences that were directly attributed to Bhagavan's grace, Bhagavan's power, and one rather um, more interesting one, which was probably uh, hallucinations engendered by having taken some hallucinogenic drug. He probably ran away at the end of that first meeting um, because he was feeling increasingly attracted to Bhagavan. He could feel the pull but he had uh, family and work responsibilities elsewhere. He didn't really want to commit himself to Bhagavan at that point. He had a mother to support, he had family, he had a job. And I think he could just feel that if he stayed there any longer, he would get sucked into Bhagavan's orbit, the ashram, and possibly be tempted to <coughs> abandon all his worldly responsibilities. So he beat a hasty retreat and went back to his job and returned about three months later but before I go into that, I want to put up the first verse that he ever composed on Bhagavan, which I didn't include last time around. If you remember, when he first came in September 1923, he stopped off at the Arunachalaswara temple and composed his first verses on Bhagavan for Bhagavan and then took them to the embryonic Raman ashram and had Bhagavan read them out. So this is uh, the first verse that he ever wrote for Bhagavan, and it says, Guru Ramana Shiva, as once you left Mount Kailash and the company of the gods, and came to cool Parantarai to drink in the sparkling words of Bhachigar, now again you have come to fair Aruna town, wishing to hearken to this fellow's pure our words. So this is the setup. So first of all, I should say, Mraguna came to Bhagavan with the hope and expectation that he was a guru who could grant him liberation but also he wanted him to be the muse, the inspiration, the divine energy that would cause him to compose divine poetry in the same way that Manika Bhatika did for Shiva 1100 years ago. So in the first verse he alludes to this old story. He says, you Shiva uh, were living on Mount Kailash with the other gods and then you came down uh, in a human manifestation uh, to the port of Parantarai, which is where Manika Vachika had been sent to buy horses for his king, in order to listen to the sparkling words of Vachika. Vachika is a contraction of Manika Vachika, and in Tamil, it's an, it's a, an honorific, not an honorific, it's a, uh, a description of his poetic genius. It means one whose speech is rubies. So that was the title that was given to Manika Vachika because of the excellence of his poetry. So Maragana said, just as you came down to our earthly world in the times of Manika Vachika to listen to his wonderful poetry, now again you've come down to fair Aruna town. Aruna town is either Tiruvannamalai or it's the mountain of Arunachala. The old term for uh, Tiruvannamalai was Arunai, so it could mean either the mountain or the town, because you wanted to listen to this fellow's pure hour words. So he's making a bid or making making it clearly known to Bhagavan that he wants to compose poetry for Bhagavan in the same way that Manika Vachika composed poems praising it, praising Shiva. So the way he did it was by composing a poem which was called Tiruven Bhavai. Now this is a title and a poem which is absolutely freighted with cultural significance in the Tamil world that you, you couldn't make a more obvious attempt to claim that this is what you wanted to do than have a poem of this name and of this style and present it to Bhagavan. I will explain that uh, Manika Vachika's uh, anthology of Tamil poetry is called Tiruvachikam and there's one poem in it called Tiruvambhavai which is one of the more famous poems in the collection and it was actually composed in Tiruvannamalai, or rather on the production road about 1100 years ago, when Manika Vachika was touring the Tamil region singing songs in praise of Shiva. So he passed through 
uh, Turban Amelie, all those centuries ago. He did a production in the early morning, arrived in the village of Adin Amle, which is on the opposite side of the hill to the main temple in town. And there he saw a group of girls heading off towards the temple of Adin Amle to uh, bathe in the tank, and after that they would go into the temple and worship Shiva. So this particular scene, this uh, vision of girls going to the temple, uh, became the superstructure, if you like, around which he composed this extraordinarily popular and well-known poem, uh, which was actually written on the production road 1100 years ago. So this is what Manik of Achika's, uh biographer wrote several hundred years later. It was the month of Margali. I'll explain Margali. Margali is the Tamil month between uh, mid-December and mid-January. Uh, Tamil months tend to start around the middle of the Western calendar months. And in Margali, uh, devotees go to the temple early in the morning and sing songs in order to wake Shiva up, in order to get him to start his work. This comes from a very endearing Tamil tradition, a cosmological, cosmolog cosmological tradition that Shiva actually works for six months and sleeps for six months and his six months of hibernation ends at the beginning of the Margali month, at which point he's fallen a bit behind with his work of maintaining the world. So he has to start work in the temples a little bit earlier. So to conform to this idea, this tradition, devotees go to the Tamil Shiva temples through the Margali month one hour earlier than usual. They go there about 4 a.m. in the morning and they sing what is called uh, waking up songs. They go there and they say, please Shiva, you've been on holiday, you've been asleep for a while. We urge you to get up and uh, get back to your work of running the world. So this is this interesting tradition that for one month, uh, Shiva needs to get up one hour early in order to uh, get the business of the world back on an even keel. So this was the tradition that Manika Vachika was observing. He was walking through Adi and Amale 1100 years ago and uh, he saw these girls. I'll read it again. It was the month of Margali when in the 10 days before the Ardra Asterism, the beautiful maidens go from household to noble household, calling each other out in the early dawn, just as the darkness is dispersing, and banding together, go to bathe in the holy tank. On observing their noble qualities, he sang the immortal hymn, Tiruven Bhavai, which is composed as if sung by the maidens themselves. So before I continue, um, this photo was taken by my friend Marcus Horlacher. He lives near Adinamle. This possibly isn't taken during Margali, but it's a, mid, a midwinter photo taken near Adinamle, the location where Manika Vachika sang his poem. And of course, the sun has risen a little bit, so it's not quite pre-dawn. But I imagine this is pretty much, give or take, an electric pylon, what Manika Vachika would have seen as he walked around the mountain 1100 years ago. This is uh, a nice old photo of Adin, Adin Amle on the left. You can see the Adin Amle temple in the, the black and white, the left hand side of the photo. And on the left photo itself is the modern uh, shrine, which was erected to commemorate the composition and the singing of this song in Adin Amle about 1100 years ago. It might look like one of the modern uh, gaudily painted concrete structures which have been erected on the production road in recent decades, but don't let that fool you. There are epigraphs, uh, carvings in the stone walls of the temple, which date this building back to at least the early 1200s, and it's quite likely it's a little bit older than that. So this is the place on the left where he saw the road going down to the temple, which you can see on the black and white photo. He saw the girls going down that street from house to house and then he made this wonderful poem in which he used the, uh, the imagery of girls going to the temple to make uh, a poem about uh, the, the necessity of merging with God. So I'll give you one, one verse and I'll give you that verse because it's one of Bhagavan's favourites. Here again, another wonderful photo from Marcus the dawn's early light over Adi Namale. So this is Tiruvambhavai by, by Manika Vachika, verse 18. I'll go through it in segments because it's a bit dense. 
even as the gems that thickly cluster upon the crowns of gods on high, when they bow down, will lose their luster before the lotus feet of Lord Anamale. Likewise, the sun with bright-eyed gaze dispels the darkness with his rays, making stars flee, their cool light fade. So here is the initial image. Um, Anamale Aranachala is identified as Shiva in front of him. He is also uh, cast as the blazing sun of Jnana, who dispels the darkness of ignorance. And, he's, and there's also a kind of secondary allusion to the fact that he is the greatest of the gods and that the luster of other gods fades in the, the blazing light of his sun-like form. So the next section, that's the unmanifest uh, form of Shiva, if you like, the radiant light, the radiant grace that dispels darkness. But in Shaivism, Shiva is also the world. He's also uh, God in an imminent form. So the next section refers to this. Thus does he, Shiva, stand before us as woman, as man, as androgyne, as the space that coexists with the effulgent sun and moon, as earth yet separate, yet from all these separate, ambrosia to the eye made manifest. There is uh, an interesting list of components of the manifest world. It's the five elements, it's the sun and the moon, and it's all living beings. So the totality of all those composed, composes the mani manifest world. So what Manikavatika is saying, that not only are you the unmanifest, the sun, the bright sun of grace that dispels darkness, you also simultaneously are the totality of all manifestation. But look down towards the bottom, yet from all these separate. So although what you see is Shiva, when you look at Aranachala, he is also fundamentally transcendent, fundamentally separate, never entirely involved in this world that you see. But if you do see him in this form, if you do see him in his manifest form, then he is ambrosia to the eye made manifest. He's the, he's, he is the nectar, seeing him is the nectar that gives you, gives you the bliss, if you like. And then having described or set the scene of describing who or what Shiva is in both his unmanifest and manifest forms, Manikavatika gets to the, um, the story of the verse, if you like, and he says, So sing you then of his holy feet, O maid, and in the flowery flood plunging bathe. Now in Shaivism, you don't approach Shiva directly. If you want to go to Shiva, you first access the female energy, the Shakti. And in Tamil poetry, this is symbolized by the tanks which are at the entrance of the shrines of the temples. So the idea is you go uh, in order to gain access to Shiva, but first you have to merge in the power of the female divine, which is symbolized by the temple uh, at the main entrance to the temple. So what Manikavatika is telling the girls to do here is hurry, hurry to the temple, uh, go and plunge yourselves into the waters of that temple tank, tank and bathe there. Now at the bottom, there's this interesting little Tamil phrase, El or Empavai. Manikavatika ended many of his uh, poems, many of his verses, with rather cryptic expressions which are thought to derive from children's games that were played more than a thousand years ago. So the, the girls would play on the street, they'd have games involving the kind of equivalent of marbles on the street or something like that. Very simple, primitive games. And at various points, you would have to say something or chant something. It might be a, a cry of triumph or an exhortation to continue or some indication that you've reached some point of the game. The actual real meanings are lost in the, the mists of history. So there, there's been a lot of speculation about what these final lines mean. But the, the one that I like for this one, the one that appeals to me to the most, is it's embrace and know. So what Manikavatika is saying is go to the temple tank, plunge into the waters, which, are, which symbolize the female divine en energy. And then he calls out Elo Empavai, which is embrace and know the divine. So go to the tank, plunge into it, bathe, become one, attain union with the female energy. And having done that, then you can proceed into the temple and access the, the transcendent uh, God. You're, you're no longer in a state of union. You go in and you find the true Shiva, the consciousness of Shiva on the inside. So this is just one of the many verses of Manikavatika's poem. And I picked this particular one because it was a favorite of Bhagavan's. So here is... Uh, 
Ramaswamy Pillai, he's got arms folded on the right, Sorinagama on the left. Uh, Sorinagama records that in, in the hall in the 1940s, Bhagavan got up off his sofa and decided to go for a walk. Maybe he was going to the kitchen or the cow shed or some errand. And Manika, uh, Ramaswamy Pillai was a bit disappointed that Bhagavan was leaving. So in, a, in an attempt to persuade him to stay a bit longer and give him darshan for a bit longer, he started chanting this, uh, this verse which I just explained on the previous slide. The, the, the tactic, the ruse worked, Bhagavan stopped, somehow got caught by the words, went back on to his sofa and sat down and very patiently listened to the whole verse. I think he liked this verse, this is just my guess, um, because of its imagery. He, Manika Vachika specifically mentions Lord Anamale in the verse. He equates Lord Anamale with the great son of Jnana who dispels the darkness of ignorance. And I think he would have liked the the basic theme of exhorting or encouraging people to go to the temple and plunge into the waters of divine energy and become one with God. So I think Bhagavan liked this and I do know that in the Margali month, which is as I said mid-December to mid-January, the Tamil Parayana at Ramanashram, the normal service was suspended and the Tiruvambave poem was chanted at four o'clock, the traditional time of going to the temple to wake up Shiva early and Bhagavan sat through these uh, yearly annual chantings of, Tir of Tiruvambave during the period um, mid-December, mid-January. And As I was putting this uh, slideshow together the thought suddenly occurred to me that possibly that was why Murugana turned up at that particular moment. We only know that he turned up in December so that gives him a 50-50 chance of showing up during Margali month. He may actually have chosen his uh, timing to bring to Bhagavan this copy of his own poetry entitled Tiruvambave and to have Bhagavan read it during the Margali month when everybody would have been conscious of the Tiruvambave poem and would have been listening to it every day. Now, having given that rather long digression into the original Tiruvambave, let's have a look, just a brief glimpse of what Maragana was offering. So this is how he begins one of his verses. Let us bathe in and sing the glories of Anamale Ramana who bestows his grace through his eyes. Now remember the original Tiruvambave verse had the structure of girls being exhorted, embrace and know, to go to the temple tanks and merge in the divine waters which symbolize the divine energy to become one with the female aspect of Shiva and from there to proceed on into the temple to get oneness or unity with Shiva itself. Murugana tweaks the whole concept. So he is exhorting devotees in general, let us bathe in and sing in the glories of Anamle Ramana who bestows his grace through his eyes. So the bathing is not in a physical location, He's not saying that you have to go to some kind of preliminary uh, place before you get to Bhagavan. Go directly to Bhagavan. You don't need to bathe anywhere. You don't need to invoke any Shakti or divine em energy. All you have to do is present yourself and look at him. And as you look at him, he will look back at you. And the, the power and the grace that comes through his eyes will transform you to such an extent that you will attain union with the divine. So he's tweaked the whole notion of the original Tiruvambavai from a ritual temple worship in which you're required to do um, a stopover at a temple tank to somehow get the grace of the female energy. He's saying, no, not necessary. Just report to Bhagavan at Ramanashram, sit there quietly, have him look at you and bathe in all the energy that comes from his eyes. And through that bathing, you will come to experience who he is and who you are. Now this on the right, this is uh, Sadhu Om. Sadhu Om was a long time collaborator, friend, Guru Bhai of Murugana. Uh, Sadhu Om showed up in 1946 and for many years he helped uh, Murugana with his literary works. After Murugana passed away, Sadhu Om became his literary executor. And I think we can say quite fairly that without Sadhu Om, a vast proportion of Murugana's poetry would have been lost. He made copies of it, he organized it, he edited it and 
in the later year, in his own later years, he arranged for it all to be brought out. Just a possible uh, indication of the enormousness of the work he did. He edited the uh, the volume of Tamil poetry called Sri Ramana Jnana Bodham, which is over 18,000 verses, all composed by Murugana. And I think without Sadhuwam's uh, curatorial role in that without his editing, I think a, a significant portion of those verses would have been lost. So here is Sadhuwam describing, I presume, what Murugana had told him about this first meeting with Bhagavan, uh, sorry, the second meeting with Bhagavan in December 1923. And he writes, He, Murugana, one day composed as Tiruvambhave, beginning with the word Anamale Ramanan. Seeing that the verses of that song were replete with many sublime features, similar to Manikavachika's Tiruvachikam, Sri Bhagavan playfully asked, can you sing like Manikavachika? So this, this was the cue that Murugana had been waiting for. On his first visit, he'd had two good experiences, but the issue of being commissioned by Bhagavan to write poetry hadn't been broached. Bhagavan hadn't responded to his first attempt to frame him at, in that role. But this time, Bhagavan, of his own accord, is saying, can you sing like Manikavachika? Now, this, this is not, um, it's not a commission, it's not an order, it's simply saying, have you got the talent, have you got the skill, and have you got the spiritual maturity to, fall this, to fulfill this particular role? Murugana, though, took this to be uh, an order from Bhagavan, so Sadhuam continues, Though Murugana took these words to be a divine command from his guru, he prayed to him, Where is Manikavachika's divine experience of true jnana, and where is my state of anjana? Only if Bhagavan removes my anjana by his grace, will it be possible for me to sing like Manikavachika? By the mere talent of this ego, how is it possible to sing like him? So what Murugana is saying is that you are asking, can I sing like Manikavachika? To which the only possible response is, if I have an individual self, if I have an ego, then the answer has to be no. However, if through your grace you decide to remove my anyana, my ignorance, then there's a possibility that I might be able to have that same talent, or not I might be able to have that talent, that divine flow might come from me simply because my own ego, my own sense of self has been eradicated and then your grace, your power will move through me and cause these verses to manifest. So what he's saying is that I will, not, I could, I will never have the talent, I will never have the ability to sing like Manikavachika, but if you bestow your grace on me and remove my ignorance, then there's a possibility that what comes out of me might be of the same order, the same kind of poetry that came out of Manikavachika long ago. So this is uh, Sadhuam's description uh, of what happened in that encounter. Here is uh, Murugana's own account from uh, Ramana Sanadi Murai. And he wrote, I, Murugana said, Where is my ignorant mind, which is like an owl blind to the bright sunlight, and which is darker than even the darkest darkness? And where is his experience of self, which surges as true jnana devoid of dark delusion? To compare me with him is like comparing a firefly with the sun. So he recognizes Manikavachika's superior talent, but he's also saying that that superior poetic ability didn't arise in Manikavachika simply because he had a better intellect, a better poetic gift. It arose in him simply because he had erad eradicated his sense of self so completely that Shiva was allowed to shine within him and cause this poetry to flow. So he has said, I can't do it of my own accord you need to reorder my insides, you need to remove me as an individual person, as an individual composer, you need to shine within me, and then there's a possibility. And then Murugana continues, As I spoke in that way, that Lord who shines in my heart stirred my mind and made it blossom by his grace, and thus, without my doing, he composed the work Sri Ramana Sanadi Murai, so that his true glory should flourish and shine exalted. The Sri Ramana Sanadi Murai is the equivalent of Manikavachika's Tiruvachikam, and it means testament to Sri Ramana's presence. It's a, it's a declaration of the greatness of Bhagavan and the presence uh, which removes the darkness of devotees who come to him. So what he's saying here is that Bhagavan didn't inspire him to write poetry. What Bhagavan did 
was remove Morogana so completely that Bhagavan himself was the composer. If you look at the grammar of the final paragraph, he's saying, he, Bhagavan, composed the work Sri Ramana Sanadi Morai, so that his true glory should flourish and shine exalted. So Morogana leaves the picture as an individual, as a jiva inside the body, who used his mind and his intellect to compose poetry. Bhagavan put his power inside, and somehow using the uh, the, the, the Tamil knowledge that Morogana had as a kind of prism through which his light would shine, and what came out of the other side of that prism was Bhagavan's own poetry run through the prism of Morogana's intellect, but without any uh, volitional input from Morogana himself. So back to Saduam. Um, he concludes his little account of this by saying, Becoming in this way a target of Sri Bhagavan's divine love, Sri Maragana was transformed into an exalted divine poet. Just as Lord Shiva made Manika Vachika sing to Ravachikam, having bestowed upon him the direct experience of the self, so Bhagavan made Maragana sing Sri Ramana Sanadi Marai in the style of Tiruvachikam, having in a single moment stirred his mind by his grace. So Maragana is saying that from this moment on, the poetry that came out of him couldn't really be attributed to him. It was a natural, spontaneous flow um, that somehow was brought into being by the Bhagavan inside himself that used, shall we say, the old intellectual structure that Murugana had accumulated over a lifestyle of studying Tamil. And the end result was very much Bhagavan's own poetry, but run through the prism of Murugana's mind. Ah, I need to just say how, how these verses came into being later. There's a, there's a nice account by Bhagavan himself when he talks about uh, composing his own Aranachala verses. I forget which one it was, but he said that these words arose spontaneously inside my head and they appeared there so quickly, so easily, and without any sense of volition that when I first saw them appear inside my head, my first reaction was, I've just remembered somebody else's poem. I wonder, I wonder whose poem that was. And then Bhagavan said, I looked at the words that had popped up in my head and realized it was me talking about my own experience about Aranachala and realized that uh, I, I had composed those words myself, but they'd just come out very simply, very elegantly, very easily without any personal volition through the power of the self. I think this is what happened to Murugana. This is the way Murugana, uh, I won't say his brain, I won't say his mind, but poetry flowed out of Murugana in the same way that Bhagavan said that those particular verses flowed out of him when he composed them early on in the Virupaksha cave period. Murugana um, would be sitting quietly minding his own business, and I think a verse would arise inside his head, almost ready-made. It would come there, um, without thinking, he didn't have to sit and work out the meter or the, the scanning or the, the rhyming or anything else. He would just sit there and a four line or some verse would come into his head and he would write it down or he would say it out loud. And then the tap would be turned off for a while and then a little bit later another verse would come out and another. So he made a point of writing them down as they appeared almost ready made inside his head. And in, in, in later years, if he didn't have any paper handy, he would compose, not compose, he would record these spontaneous verses on a, a slate. He was quite old school. He had a slate and a piece of chalk, and he would write down these verses on his slate, and then he would sit. And if the next verse popped into his head before anyone had come along to record the previous one on the slate, Murugana would just wipe it with his sleeve, and that particular verse would be lost forever. So I, I think a lot of verses um, would come into his head, and if he wasn't in it, convenient position to write them down on paper or if he had to wipe out his slate to get them recorded. Um, if those provisions weren't available, then the, the verse will be lost to posterity. So having said that, um, I think we can safely say that over the course of his life, he ran up about 25,000 verses. Some of them recorded Bhagavan's teachings, such as Guru Vajika Kovai, Padamalai, but the vast majority of them were poems praising Bhagavan, 
thanking him, expressing gratitude for the grace he bestowed. And these were the poems that formed the vast bulk of his poetic output. And I think they just came out spontaneously, almost without any thought or planning at all. Now, here is Tiruvannamalai Station on the left. So we're in December 1923. Um, Murugana has now received a good experience from Bhagavan. He's got this direct experience. He's got the commission from Bhagavan. But he's very uh, unwilling to commit himself full-time to Ramanashram. He has a family, he has a mother, he has a job. So from 1923 to 1926, he commutes between wherever he's working, wherever his family is, and just comes to Raman Ashram at weekends. I, I mentioned early on in this talk that he just felt this magnetic pull towards Bhagavan and found it incredibly hard to uh, leave at the end of the weekend. And this got progressively harder and harder as he came more often to Raman Ashram. And I put these pictures up because there's a wonderful story that illustrates this. On Sunday afternoon, all the devotees who were just there for the weekend would one by one present themselves to Bhagavan and say, may I take leave, meaning do I have your permission to go back and carry on with my, my family, my job? And Bhagavan would say yes. And then they would usually head for the station, get on their train and go back to their jobs and their families. So Murugana would do this and he'd go down to Tiruvannamalai station, he would buy himself a ticket, uh, the train would draw in, it would stay there for a few minutes, and then the train would leave with Murugana still rooted to the platform. He said he was physically incapable of putting his foot on the bottom step of, step of the carriage and getting inside the carriage and leaving Tiruvannamalai. He said he was so, att so attracted by Bhagavan, so compelled to stay close to him that the station platform was the furthest he could get from him and that he wasn't capable of taking that final step which would take him away from Bhagavan for another week. So very sheepishly he would walk back to Raman Ashram and tell Bhagavan, sorry, I, I couldn't do it, I couldn't leave. And Bhagavan, who didn't like devotees to abandon their worldly responsibilities, took this matter in hand and from then on every Sunday afternoon Mur Murugana got uh, a minder, um, a bodyguard, who would escort him down to the Tirunamale station, stand on the platform, and if Muragana somehow couldn't put his foot in the carriage, the, the, the bodyguard would bundle him into the carriage, close the door, and make sure he stayed there until the train left, and that Muragana didn't try and jump off and escape. So I'm splitting this talk into two halves because there are recording issues at this end. I've been told that the equipment here uh, tends to go a little bit wrong if you do long sessions. So I will stop here for now. I will put this picture up and start my next talk in about 30 seconds time. Thank you. I will now continue with uh, Murugana's story. In 1926, after his mother passed away, he decided to move to Tiruvannamale full time. For the first few days, he lived in the Arunachalaswara temple. And after that, he decided to move to Palakottu under circumstances that I will explain in a few minutes time. Murugana had always had a, uh, a desire to become a begging sadhu. He wasn't just content with being uh, a devotee who lived at Raman Ashram. I think he wanted to live the life of a sannyasi, although he never took formal initiation. He liked to go out and beg for his food. He liked to be independent. He didn't like to be tied down to a particular uh, situation. At uh, Raman Ashram, in those days, and even to this day, if you wanted to live at Raman Ashram, uh, eat their food, have a place to stay, then you were generally allocated some job to do, uh, some responsibilities. But if you had independent means or you were willing to go out and beg for your food, then you could live um, nearby and just come and sit with Bhagavan whenever you felt like it. So that was the life that Murugana chose for himself. He wanted to be a begging sadhu, which would give him the freedom to come to Bhagavan, come to Raman Ashram anytime he wanted to. So after a few days of uh, living in the Arunachalaswara temple, begging his food, he ended up on... Uh, 
the side of the Palakatu tank. Now this is the Palakatu tank um, taken in the early 40s. I don't know who this man is standing on the rock. I suspect he's a friend of the photographer who was a Dutch devotee called Dr. Mice. But the important and interesting uh, thing in this photo, if you look in the top right, at the top of the tank, there's a tiny little shrine. And this is the only uh, photo I've ever managed to find that showed the Ganesh temple in Palakatu in its original state as it was there in Bhagavan's time. So this rather insignificant little shrine had at one point housed Ganapati Muni. He lived there for a while. Viswanatha Swami went there to look after him. Uh, Murugana ended up living there in circumstances I will explain in a few minutes. So it has quite a distinguished uh, list of tenants who occupied it. So how, how did Murugana end up there? He brought his begged food to this tank after a few days, uh, put his food on one of those uh, terraces, and then went down to the tank to wash his hands and wash his feet before he, before he started eating. Now, I, I, I can't think of a more polite way of saying this, but I think Murugana was what modern psychiatrists would call obsessive compulsive. Um, he didn't eat anything unless he'd scrubbed, scrubbed and over scrubbed his hands and feet uh, a ridiculous number of times. So he would beg for his food. He didn't mind any kind of food put in his bowl. He would eat it, but it wouldn't get as far as his mouth unless he'd given himself an incredibly long, uh, unnecessary, excessive scrub before he started eating. So he put his food on one of those terraces. He went down to the uh, water and started scrubbing his hands. He used to put sand on his palms, rub them together, same with his feet, back to the palms, back to the feet and so on. And this would go on for so long that the food which he had collected by begging uh, would attract the local monkeys who would come down and they would eat his lunch before he had decided that his hands were clean enough to eat it. So as, as often as not, when he was scrubbing himself up to get ready to eat his food, the monkeys would beat him to it and he would go hungry. There was a, a devotee called Sabapati Pillai and he was the um, caretaker of that little Ganesh shrine at the top. So he watched this and it must have been quite amusing. He laughed and came down to Murugana and said, you're not going to get any food if this is the way you behave. Why don't you uh, occupy my little shrine? Nobody's there at the moment. You can put your food inside it and lock the door and then you can come down to the tank and you can scrub as long as you like because when it's over, your food will be safe inside the temple. So that was the new arrangement. Murugana would go out and beg for his food uh, he would scrub himself excessively before he ate it, and then he would go back to the shrine and eat it there. So this, this wasn't, um, how should we say, a temporary aberration. There's a very nice account uh, of a lady called Padma Venkataraman who looked after him in the 1950s when he lived in a house in what is now Ramananaga. She reported that in those days there was a tap on the outside wall of Raman Ashram, which was there for the convenience of devotees who didn't have running water in their own house. When Murugana, when it came time for Murugana to eat, she would go up to Raman Ashram, fill two buckets of water, stagger back to her own house. Two buckets of water is a, is a heavy load. And Murugana would then spend 10 minutes and the total contents of both buckets, scrubbing his hands, scrubbing his feet, until he was ready to put food in his mouth, and then as he was eating, poor Padma had to go back to Raman Ashram and fill up the buckets again, because when the meal was over, Murugana would need another two buckets of water to wash his hands and wash his feet again. So this was just one of his quirks, one of his personality quirks. No idea where it came from. Bhagavan made fun of it occasionally, but uh, this was the way Murugana was. He was al always extremely fastidious. In, in the next talk that I give, I will be giving more examples of this. But for now, I want to focus on the aspect of his personality that compelled him to beg for his food. Uh, the community of sadhus at Raman Ashram had started off as a begging community. At Virupaksha Cave, um, devotees would go out in the morning. They would sing songs uh, announcing their presence. Devotees of Bhagavan who lived in town would come out. They would put food in the bowls. It would all go back to Virupaksha cave and then Bhagavan would collect everything that had come in that day from the begging round, 
from devotees such as Ashima and Wadaliapati who had brought food, it would all get mixed up together and Bhagavan would serve it out into equal portions according to how many people had shown up. So for a long time the whole community lived on begged food. Uh, Bhagavan was quite, um, I won't say proud of this, but he thought this was a good way to live. He'd lived by begging during his early life in Tiruvannamalai, we'll go on to that later. And when Muruganat asked his permission to beg for his food in Tiruvannamalai, I think Bhagavan knew that this was a good lifestyle, a good way for Muragana to live. He didn't allow everybody to do this. Um, I remember talking to an Amle Swami and he at one point didn't have any resources so he asked Bhagavan if he could go out and beg for his food in the way that some other devotees did. He also lived in Palakotu but on that occasion Bhagavan said no I want you to stay in your own house I don't want you ever to ask anybody for anything I want you to live at home and only live on whatever people voluntarily choose to give you. So different devotees got different instructions and Namale Swami was asked to not beg, specifically stay at home, only accept what was given. But Muragana was given the freedom to go out and collect whatever food he could from devotees. Now just, this is Bhagavan in Palakottu, that's Krishna Swami behind him. Bhagavan went for a walk there um, at least once a day. So Bhagavan described his own begging experience. I like this because I think this is almost identical to the way that Muragana wrote it in his own verses. I'll read this out in full. This is Bhagavan begging as a teenager on the streets of Tiruvannamalai in the 1890s. He, Bhagavan, said, you cannot conceive of the majesty and dignity I felt while so begging. The first day when I begged from Guru Kaur's wife, I felt bashful about it as a result of habits of upbringing, but after that there was absolutely no feeling of abasement. I felt like a king and more than a king. I have sometimes received stale gruel at some house and taken it without salt or any other flavouring in the open street before great pandits and other important men who used to come and prostrate themselves before me. I then wiped my hands on my head and passed on supremely happy and in a state of mind in which even emperors were mere straw in my sight. You can't imagine it. It is because there is such a path that we find tales in history of kings giving up their thrones and taking to this path. But you sense a feeling of supreme satisfaction, of supreme happiness, of not going to houses as a beggar in need, but somehow as, as an expression of your inner knowledge of the self, that you can go out there, you can put your hands... I think Bhagavan used to clap, is that there? No, he, he would go down the street, he would clap, clap his hands like this, the people would come out, he would hold his hands in front of him, he would lick the food off his palms, then he would wipe his, wipe his palms on his head and go off feeling like he was an em emperor of the universe. I like that. He had such a lack, you have such a lack of ego in this state that you can do this without feeling that you're demeaning yourself in any way. So this was the state that Muragana found himself when he became um, a begging sadhu after Bhagavan had completely eradicated his ego or his sense of pride, or any, any feeling of shame that he might have had from uh, begging for his food. Let's see what comes next. Now, I'm jumping the gun a little bit here. The next few verses contain uh, obvious statements by Muragana about him realizing the self, about him becoming enlightened. Don't worry, I will explain exactly how, when and where that happened. But for the moment, I just want to focus on how the inner experience that Bhagavan gave him gave him such a positive outlook on going to beg for him his food and living on, on begged food as a matter of dignity, personal dignity. So these are the first two verses. My Lord who possesses the power of bestowing jnana, which shines abundantly in him, desired true knowledge to arise for me. As a result, what I attained inside was becoming the supreme ruler of the empire of the self. The great life I attained outside was living on begged food. I found this very similar to uh, the quote by Bhagavan on the previous slide. For sadhus, the great life of accepting and eating food as alms is the fearless and majestic life of grace. It is a reproach-free life of existing as supreme bliss in the transcendental expanse, the state of peace devoid of the leaping of the insignificant mind. So these are the first two. Before I put the next slide up, um, I'll, I'll give a couple of stories. Um, Muragana 
used to give money to Raman Ashram once a year on the anniversary of his mother's death to commemorate her. Um, I don't know where he got the money from, he must have been receiving donations, but he would hand over enough money to feed perhaps a hundred people in the Raman Ashram dining room, but he wouldn't go in himself. He would then take his begging bowl, go off to Tiruvannamale and beg for food on the same day that he'd provided funds for a hundred people to eat at Raman Ashram at his own expense. He didn't feel that he was in any way uh, obliged to go and eat with these people. He was more than happy to go on his normal begging round and eat his food when he came back. In later life, um, let's put the next one up because there's a picture of him later on. There we are. Um, he was persuaded to live at Raman Ashram in his final years and he said, you can give me a room if you like, but you're not going to turn me into a householder. I'm still going to continue to beg for my food. I'm not going to come and eat, eat my food with you. If that's okay with you, I will accept your offer of a room. And so, somewhat bizarrely, we have the situation of a devotee who at that point was probably the most venerated and revered living devotee of Bhagavan, um, begging for his food at the ashram kitchen door. He would go there and he would stand outside the kitchen door and he didn't even have a bowl or a plate. He would uh, take his towel off from round his neck, he would hold it out with a kind of scoop in the middle and a kitchen worker would put food onto his towel and he would say thank you. He would go back to his room, this photo on the right is his room at Raman Ashram, put the food on his plate and eat his bag food on his plate at Raman Ashram. So there was something about him he stuck to his sadhu lifestyle, he, he loved his begging, he loved the feeling it gave, gave him of independence, of not being dependent on an institution, and that's the way he lived his life right up to the end. So these are two more verses from uh, Raman and Yana Bodham in which he describes the, the greatness of living on begged food as a liberated sadhu. The ultimate tapas is living on begged food and doing it without the false pride, I am doing this. Those who have accomplished this should not be disregarded as degraded and undignified people. Their majesty, thriving through a dispassion that is rooted in jnana, is unattainable even for Indra, the chief of the devas. Through jnana, the authentic grace that terminates ignorance, I have been blessed with the great fortune of eating food obtained by begging in a way that elevates rather than demeans. And through the infinite Shivam nature that surges as inexhaustible wealth, both likes and dislikes became totally false. So having uh, explained Murugana's attitude to food and begging, I now need to explain how he was able to claim, as he did in all of those four verses, that he was liberated completely and definitively by Bhagavan's grace. And for that we need to go back to Palakotu. Uh, here's a lovely old photo, another lovely old photo of Palakotu. Uh, the building on the right was originally, or a precursor of it was originally built by B. V. Naraswamy in the 1920s. It was the first house uh, constructed by the sadhus in Palakotu after B. V. Naraswamy vacated it to go to Shirdi to chronicle the life of Shirdi Sai Baba. Paul Brunton became the next tenant. So it, like the shrine on the other side, it's had some distinguished occupants. What I'm more interested in is the clump of trees in the middle. Um, Palakotu means jackfruit orchard, but I've never seen a jackfruit tree there and I don't think anybody has ever mentioned one in the Raman Ashram records in all the time that Bhagavan was there. It was just a, a clump of forest next door to Raman Ashram. And this is where Murugana said that Bhagavan brought about his liberation. I have to say first that uh, in the thousands and thousands and thousands of verses that Murugana wrote saying, thank you Bhagavan for granting me the grace to establish me in the self. He almost never says where it happened or when it happened. But my feeling is that it happened in Palakatu um, probably sometime around 1926 after he moved there permanently because there are three verses in Ramana Sanadi Murai which specifically mention Palakatu as, the, as being the place where Bhagavan gave him this great and permanent experience. So I'll move on to the next slide. So this is uh, Murugana writing about the event in uh, Ramana Sanadi Murai and he says he, that's Bhagavan, took me to the forest with him on the pretext of plucking leaves to make leaf plates. 
Uh, I'll just explain leaf plates. These are not the banana leaves that most people use nowadays. For most of Ramanashram's history, uh, people ate off um, circular plates about 30 centimeters diameter, uh, which were made up of smaller leaves about this size, which were stitched together in a spiral and held together by little bits of dried grass. A very labor-intensive labor operation. Um, they were used once and then thrown away. Bhagavan, who didn't uh, feel that he should be let off any of the chores that the ashram had to do, he would go on expeditions to collect, leaf, to collect leaves, and he would also sit with the workers in the kitchen and stitch the leaf plates for the meals that were served there. Uh, before I continue, I will just throw in a, a Kanju Swami story. He said that Bhagavan used to sit with the women whose job it was to make the leaf plates, and for them it was almost a profession, that's what they did for most of the time. And he said Bhagavan could do this as well as the women, as quickly, as tidily, as efficiently. And he said this was just typical of the range of skills that Bhagavan exhibited without ever seemingly needing to learn how to do them. He told me once, we, we never watched Bhagavan practice anything. We never watched him learn anything. Whatever skill he needed to exhibit, he seemed to have it to the fullest extent. And he was always as good as the best person who was next to him. And we never saw him practice. We never saw him get better. He was just perfect in everything he did. So on this occasion, Bhagavan has decided that um, he wants to take Murugana out for a walk. And he just uses the pretext of going to that nice clump of trees in that forest to collect leaves for the ashram dining room. So I'll re retrace my steps and read this again. He took me to the forest with him on the pretext of plucking leaves to make leaf plates. There, with great delight, he destroyed my mind's restlessness by bestowing his glance on me. In the middle of the night, he subdued my divided individual consciousness, granting me the experience of the undivided reality. Now, as I say, on three occasions in Ramana Sanadi Morai, he says it happened in Palakotu, and these are the only reference points, if you like, of Bhagavan um, bestowing sufficient grace on Moragana to definitively end his sense of being an individual person. This is Kanakamal, and Kanakamal was one of a group of women who looked, not look, who were students of Moragana in the 1950s. Moragana used to give lessons on Bhagavan's works and Tamil texts, which were a bit hard to understand. He was a kind of in-house pandit at the time, and he was invited by devotees to give sessions on Tamil texts, in which he would explain exactly what Bhagavan meant or any of the literary aspects of the text. Kanakamal was one of his students, and he must have told her this story, and she got a slightly more extensive version of what happened. She wrote in her memoir, Bhagavan looked directly into his eyes, and Murugana felt the power of Bhagavan's grace flowing through him like an electric current. He lost all perceptions of time and space, and experienced a joy beyond description. Immersed in this state of bliss, Murugana was oblivious to the passage of time. It was only when he regained his senses that he realized he must have remained in this state of bliss for hours together. So, we have... Murugana getting a really intense experience that lasted for hours and hours. And when I read that for the first time, I was reminded of what happened when uh, Lakshmanaswamy sat before Bhagavan in, on Vijaya Dasami in 1949. He sat uh, just outside the old hall at about 3, 3.15 in the afternoon. Um, Bhagavan gave him, again, a, a definitive ending of the sense of being an individual self. Lakshmanaswamy said, after that experience, the individual self never arose or functioned in me again. And his response to that um, intense blast of power of grace was very similar to what Murugan reported there. He went into an intense internal state of self-absorption of bliss, which lasted for many, many hours. Lakshmanaswamy said he eventually opened his eyes about 9 p.m. that night, about six hours later. Uh, Kanakamal says many, many hours, but just it struck me as a slight similarity between the two experiences that when this definitive ending of self, of I, happens, there's something so intense um, that the body kind of goes into a, um, I wouldn't say a trance, but an, an internally absorbed state of intense bliss, and it takes a while for 
consciousness of anything other than that to manifest and put you back in the world again. So as I said earlier, there are thousands and thousands of verses in which Morogana talks about his experience of the self, although virtually none of them mention the uh, incident in Palakatu. But there's a subset of those many thousand verses in which Morogana says it happened through Bhagavan's gaze. Sometimes he uses the word gaze, glance, look. But the essential component on all of these uh, recollections is that Bhagavan was looking at him. If you remember, right at the beginning of this talk, I gave an extract from Muruganas Thiruvan Bhavai, and he said, let us bathe in the grace that flows from Bhagavan's eyes. So instead of jumping into a temple tank, he's saying, cut out the middleman, just look straight at Bhagavan, have him look at you, and as you bathe in the glory and the grace that flows from those eyes, your sense of being an individual will vanish completely, and you will find yourself, if you are lucky and mature enough, in the same state as Bhagavan. So over the years, this incident, this moment, when Bhagavan shattered his illusions of being an individual, through looking at him, through gazing at him, um, they provoked an enormous number of verses, and quite a few of them he, he talks directly about Bhagavan's look and the effect it had, the experience he had as a result of being looked at. I make no apologies, I'm going to read out four pages of these verses because I think they're absolutely wonderful. They give the essence of Murugana, his state, his gratitude towards Bhagavan, and a feeling of what his poetry is like for those who don't have the capacity to access the original. I, I should mention that uh, back in the 80s, I saw Professor Swaminathan, who translated Murugana, uh, with his nose in a book of Murugana's poetry. And he said, you know, one reason I like Murugana so much is that he says almost the same thing in every single verse, but every single verse has a slight variation, a slight twist, and everyone surprises you, everyone delights you, and you can go on reading them indefinitely because that there's such a store of experience in them and they're very, very slightly tweaked. So you never think, oh God, that's enough of that. I've had enough. You just keep going on and on and on. And by that, by a kind of uh, proxy, you're, ac you're accessing Bhagavan's look, his power, his grace, by reading these Murugana verses and just feeling through those verses just how much power Bhagavan had when he looked at you with his eyes. So here is my selection of Muruganas, then he looked at me verses, uh, translated by my friend Robert Butler, and they read, Through his gaze he bathed me in the rising flood of his grace, revealing to me the glory of the self, so that the stain of my imprisoned soul's defilement was washed away, bringing my existence to ample fulfilment by restoring it to its true nature, he has become one with me, dwelling within my heart and filling me with his light. Through his gaze that graciously bestows the jnana that cuts away birth, the irresistible delusion of maya, the Lord rebuking and destroying my ghost-like ego and bringing me to salvation conferred upon me the glorious experience of peace that is free of all confusion. I was blighted like a useless corpse, bereft of life and decaying with no worthwhile goal to aim for until the gaze of the unique master granted me his grace and engendered in my heart the realization of the self, the intangible beacon of consciousness. I was bound for destruction through my disastrous attachment to the world's illusory reality until under my fair Lord's gracious gaze, my understanding was flooded with the delightful experience of Lord Shiva's bliss. I entered a new life in the boundless realm of Mauna, the supreme reality. As the dark prison of mental bondage crumbled and disappeared, I became his servant, finding joyous life in the open sky of his ambrosial grace. The knot that locked my consciousness to the physical body was sundered by the bright sword of my master's glance and was no more. Subduing me and bringing me under his control, he drew my consciousness to himself with the irresistible magnet of his grace. From the profound depths of his mauna, his gracious glance cleaved the knot of my ego's ruinous cravings in an instant. How great is the power of his piercing grace, gaze. Through the grace-bestowing gaze of the Lord, of which I am totally unworthy, the miraculous and wonderful magic trick of the world's illusion fell away. As both bondage and liberation faded like a daydream, I merged into the state of the self which is my own radiant nature. 
Freeing myself from the confusion of desire's delusion, the path that leads to the womb, I travelled the path whose mark is the mauna taught me by the Sadguru's gaze. Perceiving and attaining the peaceful state that is free of all affliction, I merged with the delightful state of grace, the inner understanding that is beyond compare. I was a learned fool. My flawed mind knew nothing until I came to dwell with him whose glance filled my heart with the light of awareness. Dwelling in that gracious state of peace whose nature is mauna so hard to gain and know, I entered into union with the deathless state of the knowledge of reality. And finally, through his captivating gaze that is filled with the harmonious joy of the unalloyed grace whose nature is impossible to conceive, the Lord bestowed his sweetness upon me like divine nectar, sweet to the taste, such that my heart softened and melted as he ruled me through a consciousness whose nature is love. Bestowing upon me through his compassionate glance, his wisdom, like a diamond sharp and bright, my Lord Guru Ramana graciously accepted my surrender, and as the black cloud of ruinous self-delusion, which wore my body's form as a cloak, melted away, I perceived the precious jewel of my own self. To be continued in the next talk. Thank you.